So, today I'm going to talk to you about large cardinal axioms, also known as strong axioms of infinity. Let's start with the axiom of infinity. Right. So, in set theory, which can be served as the foundation of modern maths, one of the important axioms that uh, Tremello had put in to the original uh, list of axioms is simply saying the following. There is a set, let's call it Z, for Zahlen in German, because Zermelo was German, such that 0 is in Z, and if n is in Z, then n plus 1 is in Z. In other words, the natural numbers form a set. You've got 0 and 1 and every number plus 1. Exactly. Yeah. Now, to us it's very natural. It's very obvious. Uh, of course, Tremelo didn't write zero, he talked about the empty set, he didn't write n plus one, he wrote something else to code this, we talked about that in a different video. So he wrote it in a different language. So. In a different language, yes. But this is what he meant. The important thing was that there's a set that's infinite. Philosophically speaking, just as a, as a small point of importance here, up to Cantor, really, or slightly before him, infinity was this continuous computation process. What Cantor did was to say, no, 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 let's make infinity into a complete concept. So there's one collection of all the natural numbers. That's an object in maths. And when Tremelo wrote his axioms, he wrote this axiom. So this is the axiom of infinity. And we call it that because when we look at a set like this, we say, oh, of course it's infinite. The simple mind of someone like me is like thinks, well, how can you have a set that's infinite because, you know, you call it an object because you could have no container big enough to fit infinite numbers. But when you say an object, you're not thinking of like a cup yeah. and that. You're just thinking of it as a, a single entity you can manipulate in your brain. Exactly. It's not just that. It's if you think about the mathematical universe and you could be thinking about this in it exists somewhere, it exists in our head, it only exists on paper. But it's an object, a complete object, in that universe, however you choose to think of it. Since then, this is 1904, uh, it's been 120 years or so, and so we have studied a lot more about mathematics. And we have learned that this infinity can be extended. We can go beyond that. We had talked before about Aleph zero, which is the size of the smallest infinity, and then there was Aleph one, and Aleph two, and so on. Links, links in the notes to the other videos. And then we had Aleph Omega, which was infinitely many successive steps beyond, and we kept going. Now, to an extent, large cardinal axioms come to answer what's beyond absolute infinity, in a particular way. So what do we mean by this? Aleph zero is the first infinity, and it has some very nice properties. For example, if we look at this line of natural numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, and then continue, and maybe here we have n and n plus one, and so on. If I take two numbers here and I add them together, I get a slightly larger number, but it's still here. This is Aleph zero. So the summation of these two is still here. Okay, what about the multiplication? Four times n is just n times four. It's just here somewhere. What about exponentiation? All right, if I look at n and I say, okay, let me map this into two to the n. If this was a natural number, this is also a natural number. So it's still significantly smaller than Aleph zero. Significantly. Yes. <laughs> You're never gonna get to Aleph zero. Yes. So as, and, and this is why you need the axiom of infinity to say Aleph zero exists. Because it tells you there's a set that represents being Aleph zero. There's a, a nice saying, and I can't remember who said it. You know, yes, this is a large number, but most numbers are larger. The axiom of infinity says, again, Aleph zero is a number, it exists. But now, we started saying, okay, we have all of these nice properties of Aleph zero in terms of, for example, this ability to, to absorb exponentiation. 
What happens if we say there's an even larger point up there, let's call it kappa, which is the Greek letter for K, maybe there's another one here that's also closed under exponentiation. So where? So you continue in the mathematical universe. You go from Aleph 0 and you have Aleph 1 and Aleph 2 and so on. And then maybe somewhere very large up there, there's a, some kind of cardinal number kappa. And if you take the exponentiation of two things below kappa, it stays below kappa. Just like when we took 2 to the n, it stayed below Aleph 0. Just to check something, and yeah. you were talking to me about adding numbers and yeah. multiplying and exponentiation with our n's, which, yeah. which were numbers as I understand them. Yeah. When you talk about Aleph 1, Aleph 2, Aleph 3, all these things that are sitting yeah. up above Aleph 0, are they numbers or are they whole sets? Is, is like Aleph 3 and Aleph 10 and all this sort of stuff, are they sets or are they actual numbers? Like, can you have Aleph 3 to the power of Aleph 5 or Aleph 7 plus right. Aleph 9? So, it's a fantastic question. Uh, sets are the object of our universe, because we're studying set theory. Yeah. Right? Numbers, as we discussed a while back, are just a way to model a concept of quantity. Right? So we pick a set and say this set is going to be Aleph 5. Now, we pick it in a very clever way, it's going to have size Aleph 5. I can't just pick a point and say this is going to be Aleph 5, even though it has just one point. I want it to be some kind of reasonable. I don't have to, by the way, but I want to because it makes everything else nice. So, as concepts, they're both sets, but they're also numbers. They represent quantity. Okay. Uh, the quantity here is how many things do I have in my set? So Aleph 5 will be the canonical things that has, uh, the canonical set that has exactly Aleph 5 uh, many members. So I can do Aleph 5 plus Aleph 6 yes. as addition. As addition. The thing is that once you go to infinity, addition and multiplication becomes kind of trivial and you just look at the index and say which one's larger and that's the answer. So, I will also uh, remind you, if you had forgotten, which may very well be the case, that exponentiation of cardinals is in fact interesting. Aleph 0 to the power of Aleph 0 is equal to 2 to the Aleph 0, and it is at least Aleph 1, which is itself greater than Aleph 0. So whereas Aleph 0 plus Aleph 0 was just Aleph 0, and Aleph 0 times Aleph 0 was just Aleph 0, Aleph 0 to the power of Aleph 0 is larger. How large? Well, that's a question that uh, Georg Cantor asked and uh, had tormented him for many years, uh, and we now know cannot be answered using these axioms of set theory. We can add axioms that solve it, but the standard ones are insufficient for this. Okay. But we do know it goes up. Right? And Aleph 1 to the power of Aleph 1 will be greater than Aleph 1. So the question is, can we find a point up here on this you know, sequence of cardinal numbers, which is so large that it can be closed under this exponentiation function? It can absorb the problem. Exactly. Now, the answer to that, surprisingly perhaps, or maybe not surprisingly, because infinity is so large, is yes, we can. However, we want this, this cardinal number to have additional properties that we call regularity. So, this is a property that Aleph 0 has. What is this property? Well, if I take finitely many things below Aleph 0, right, and I say, what's the largest value I can reach there? It's some finite set of finite numbers. So it has a maximum. Right? Maybe that maximum was 7, maybe it was 100 million and 3. But it was just bounded below Aleph 0. As we said earlier, most numbers are larger. This property of Aleph 0 is called regularity. Now, if we look at Aleph Omega, we actually have a set that is very small, Aleph 0 and Aleph 1 and Aleph 2 and so on, all the Aleph Ns, that goes all the way to Aleph Omega. So Aleph Omega is not regular, because you can reach it from below with a small collection. You can reach... how do you reach 
So how do you reach Aleph Omega? So Aleph Omega, in fact, by definition, is the supremum of Aleph 0, Aleph 1, Aleph 2, Aleph N, and so on. The points this set has size Aleph 0 because I matched it with the natural numbers. 0 goes to Aleph 0, 1 goes to Aleph 1, 2 goes to Aleph 2. So I have a small set because this collection has size Aleph 0, but it reaches all the way to Aleph Omega. So Aleph Omega is not a nice cardinal in this sense. It's not regular. And so strong axioms of infinity essentially say, let's pick a nice property of Aleph 0 and ask for this property to hold somewhere up in the universe. And we want this property, usually it will either imply that the cardinal is regular, but sometimes you have to add it explicitly, but it gives you something stronger than just Aleph 0. It says, I had this axiom that said this exists, let me strengthen it. Let me say there's a bigger set that also has this property. Turns out that these axioms are strong also in a philosophical mathematical sense. So if I assume, let's say that if I'm working in Sir Mello Frankel with the axiom of choice, what Gödel showed is that this does not prove that ZFC is consistent. So you cannot prove your foundation of mathematics is error-free by using the same foundation. But you can add new axioms to it. So if you say there's now a cardinal kappa which has this property that it is regular, and it is closed under exponentiation, then you can prove that ZFC is consistent. You can prove a lot more actually, but that gets very technical and we don't have to go there. And then you can say, okay, what if I have an axiom that says there are two of those, or three, or four, or a lot, or... And this gives you a hierarchy of axioms. And you can take stronger and stronger properties of Aleph zero and generalize them. This gives you a hierarchy of what we now call large cardinal axioms. And then comes the obvious question. Who cares? <laughs> Clearly, if all you want to do is engineer this building and, and build it, you, you, you don't care. However, if you're a mathematician and you want to say, well, I want my mathematical universe to be nice. I want uh, uh, things to have a well-defined volume in space. Okay, so this table has a well-defined volume in space. And this room has a well-defined volume in space. But it turns out that, especially if, assuming, if we assume the axiom of choice, we can do all kinds of crazy things and end up with collections that don't have a volume. Famous example is the Banachtalski paradox. You take a ball, split it into five points, just slightly move them around, and you have two copies of the same ball. It makes no sense. So, you want to say maybe sets that have a nice description, have a volume, have a well-defined notion of volume. If you want to have this kind of extension go up, suddenly you run into a problem. Suddenly this assumption itself requires you to assume that large cardinal axioms are consistent. So it requires more than just ZFC as a foundation. It sounds to me, as my simple and misunderstanding of everything goes, like this ZFC, which is so important to people like you, an axiom of choice, has a problem. Mm -hmm. So you've invented some other number or set of numbers, this kappa, that just makes your life easier. Like you've said, oh, well, hang on, we've run into a problem with our, the rules of our game here. Let's invent an another rule so we can keep playing. Yeah, to an extent, yes. Right? You, you, you try to push the limits of all of this. But also, mathematicians in general, the bread and butter of what we do is take a concept, can we generalize the concept? So you want to say, well, why is Aleph zero so special? We want to have more things like it, we want more general things. Can we prove they exist? Turns out we can't. But it turned out that it gave us a very useful hierarchy of axioms that allow us to measure how strong is a mathematical statement. If you want to say all sets that have so-and-so property, uh, sets of real numbers, you know, let's, let's keep it useful, quote-unquote, uh, all sets of real numbers with a certain 
complexity in their definition, have a nice property like this or that, this can be measured on the large cardinal hierarchy how strong this assumption is. It's a yardstick for philosophy, if you will, to, to discuss whether this assumption is more reasonable or less reasonable than a different assumption. Now, the technicalities, the technicalities behind all of this are fascinating and, you know, people wrote many books about them. We're not going to go into any of it. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just here to tell you that these are axioms that have an interesting and inherent value as a yardstick. What people often confuse is they say, well, if assuming that I have this strong axiom of infinity, I can now prove that ZFC is consistent. That means that they're not consistent because ZFC doesn't prove this. Right. I was going to, I was going to ask, you know, you're coming up with new numbers and sets and ideas to let you do more playing in mathematics, but that doesn't mean any of this actually exists in nature. Sure. But I guess you'll say, does any mathematics exist in yeah, nature? Yeah, exactly. Right. We have a concept that says like, oh, there are two of these, but this is not two, right? Why is this any different from these two? The number is an abstraction, right? And, you know, you might be a person who thinks that the mathematical universe actually exists out there, but... You can't see it. You don't know. How dare you even think that you, of all people, know exactly what's in it? We don't know. So if you believe that it exists, it doesn't necessarily preclude the existence of these kind of large numbers. The, the point is that this is where people make this kind of very deep mistake that I'm hoping to help and correct. When you add these new axioms, you get a stronger theory. You can prove more. all the way up to infinity plus infinity, and further and further and further. There's no last Aleph, there's no largest Aleph. This just sounds like a kid saying, you know, when you say to a kid, is there a number bigger than infinity? They'll just say, oh, infinity plus one. And then and they'll say, oh, infinity plus infinity. Right? And they're not wrong. No. Yeah, this is kind of the, the, the thing, right? Infinity, as this was understood, this original infinity in, from the 17th century,